So today I'm going to be talking about real-time sensor anomaly detection with uh, Azure and the Scikit-Learn stack. There's going to be some data science involved, some pre-processing, some machine learning, but most of the emphasis is really going to be about how do people like you who are very deep in the data science world take your models, put in production, and, are, and without having to manage all the infrastructure and headaches yourself. So. Uh, before I get started, just a little bit about myself. My name is Ari Bornstein. Uh, as I was introduced, I work for Microsoft on an open source team. So we engage with different uh, startups and uh, companies in the Israeli ecosystem. We work with them to partner on interesting projects, which we then open source the learnings and share with the development communities and developers like you. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about a recent engagement. Uh, related to municipal wastewater management. So before I get started, I'm going to give a lecture on municipal wastewater management. Yeah, I know. That's, that's probably what your reaction is when you think of municipal wastewater management. And uh, I don't blame you. It's boring. And why do we really care? Well, the reason we care is when you think about it, we care when it all goes wrong. When it goes wrong, when leaks happen, when pipes burst, when sewage is in the streets, it can cost municipalities millions, if not billions dollars of damage. And they want to be able to make sure that in advance that they can build robust infrastructure that fits to the risks that are associated with uh, flooding and overflow for wastewater management. Uh, believe it or not, that most of this is the, for most uh, municipalities, they have a general idea of how much water is going to go into their system at a given time. However, the two leading clause, causes of uh, overflow are these concepts of inflow and infiltration. So inflow is caused by when somebody, like, uh, and this happens actually more than you'd think in Israel, where somebody does like a combina, they're building, uh, they have the nadlan, he puts a little pipe, and he's putting water and introducing water that's not supposed to be in the system illegally. Uh, infiltration is, and this happens a lot more in like countries like the United States, where you have older infrastructure, you start seeing leaks that seep through where groundwater enters uh, the water management system in ways that's unexpected and that's very, very hard to detect. And what's really challenging about both inflow and infiltration is for municipalities, especially ones that scale across wide verticals from industry to residential areas to you name it, it can be very, very hard to predict where this is happening, when it's going to happen, and the effects it's going to have on a system. Now, there are some traditional rules of thumb for uh, gauging this that were uh, put together in the 1970s. And essentially the way that it works is you put a couple of what are called flow meters and rain gauges along sewer pipe across cities. You put one about every 200 feet, or what is that in meters? I'm um, sorry, I'm still, I'm an Ole Hadash, so I'm still adjusting to the whole meter system. But you can imagine you put it every couple of meters. And then what you do is you measure during a dry season you measure during a rainy season, and you kind of take the difference and you assume that that's a good estimate. But the reality is it's not that great of an estimate. It's very, very high level. And there are two traditional challenges with this. One is when they built these systems, the traditional sensors are rain gauges and meters. You had to manually read them. So you have to send somebody, a utility man, to go in and manually check all these sensors, write all the readings in a little spreadsheet. And then they'd run it in every nine months, 10 months, year, they'd do an analysis report and try to figure out where they're going to do the infrastructure for the next year. That was challenge number one. And challenge number two is the traditional algorithms for predicting infiltration and flow were developed based on what are called uh, life cycle assessment studies in the 1970s. And what did that entail? That entailed that they had certain researchers who would come maybe once a week or once every couple of days with a yardstick, stand in the sewer, and take discrete measurements. And then they fit the points over a period of maybe five, six years. And they try to use like a standard linear regression or some of the general statistical algorithms of the 1970s to fit that curve and generalize that algorithm for the rest of the world. So you can imagine in, with big data in the world that we live in, this has started to change. And so 
As you can see, IoT is enabled real-time monitoring of applications, and uh, which enables more accurate predictions, but the models, the traditional models, were not a good fit for that. Well, I'm not going to speak to you about actually building models for that are more accurate here, because there are companies that do that. So for instance, Microsoft recently partnered with a company called uh, Carl Data Solutions. They essentially aggregate, uh, they upgrade all these flow sensors across municipalities, and then they aggregate this data into a management tool, which then can be used for predictive analysis. But they recently noticed that they had an issue. And what was the issue that they had? Well, many of these sensors, especially because they're submerged in water, they tend to fail. And when these sensors fail, they don't just go offline, as you would imagine. They actually give data back. And that data becomes really hard to differentiate between the anomalies or the outliers that you're running an outlier detection model on for, sensor, for uh, detecting inflow and infiltration. So when they were building their standard algorithms, they would take uh, you know, a standard outlier approach. They'd come up with uh, anomaly detection algorithms that outliers, but now they have two different types of outliers, one caused by sensor error, and one caused by what they're trying to measure, and they need a way to differentiate that. So that's where we come in, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about today, how we solve this. I'm gonna show a very basic model, not the actual production model, but how we solve this and actually put this into pr production. So just very high level or solution out, architecture, we start with Azure Machine Learning. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, but there's two layers of it. At the top layer, there's a ML Studio, which is not necessarily made for in-depth data scientists, but it's made for experimentation. I'll show a quick demo of that a little bit. But what it really enables you to do is take your models, put them into production with a production endpoint without having to manage all of that infrastructure yourself. And there's a marketplace that allows you to monetize your APIs as well. And also what's really, really nice about it is not only does it integrate with Azure services, but it integrates directly with Jupyter Notebooks and there's a Jupyter Notebook service so you don't have to maintain your own Jupyter Notebooks and it's all in one centralized location that everybody can prototype from. At the next layer we use something called Event Hubs. What Event Hubs does is it allows us to, it's similar to uh, maybe you guys are familiar with uh, Apache Storm for uh, stream processing and Apache Kafka. So it's similar to that where it essentially allows you to uh, pull in data million, from millions of devices in a scalable way. Then we use uh, what's called stream analytics to process this data in real time and then we can actually do real time processing, real time classification if we want. Um, and then and across all of our devices with the data that's coming in. And then where it gets interesting is we have visualization suite through Power BI that enables us to see in real time. Now, I know what some of you guys are probably thinking. You're thinking, okay, this is great, a lot of marketing slides, a cool solution. So that's enough slides. Let's actually get into some code. I'm a developer too, I promise. So uh, before I get started, I'm just gonna, point to one resource here. So all of this engagement is documented on our uh, GitHub repo, Catalyst Code. So every, as I said earlier, every engagement we do, we code everything, we share it with the community. We have this here and we also have a blog, Real Life Code, that you can look on and if you want to follow up afterwards, that's a great resource to go. Uh, addition, Microsoft uses this standard API for anomaly detection, I'm just pointing it out for documentation purposes, and let's get started. So. This right here is the Azure Machine Learning Studio. There are, uh, again, as I said, there's a nice way that I, if I'm you know, new to data science, what I can go and I can set up a project. One second, let me, I can go upload different data sets and I can run basic experiments. So I have one here that I created, very, very basic. What this does is it takes some of the real data that I have from uh, a real pipe I can visualize this data, and you can see it's a little blurry, but you can see we have a lot of date times and we have a lot of uh, flow values, and then we can essentially very, very simply run a series of modules like time series anomaly detection, and we can do the basic outlier detection, which is similar to the approach that they were using before that, again, was problematic for them because they couldn't differentiate between the different outliers, what was caused by sensor error and what was caused by uh, 
actual inflow and infiltration. So that's one way of prototyping. Uh, since we're all Python people here, I'm not going to bore you with that. Instead, I, we also provide what's called uh, Azure Notebook Service, which allows you, wow. Yeah, I'm going to try to do that right now. And I noticed that the res my device is a 4K device, so I don't know if it uh, scales very well to the screen. But is this uh, easier to see? Yeah. All right, perfect. So what's really nice about this is it allows me, instead of having to spin up my own uh, Jupyter server for each device, I can have one centralized place where all my data scientists can uh, prototype from. Uh, so here, just to get started, I um, didn't import a bunch of uh, services that I need from Azure ML, from Scikit-Learn, uh, just a couple other things like NumPy and uh, online services. Uh, I've been told to preface, so actually before I gave this presentation, I had a uh, practice run through with Brett Cannon, who is one of the core contributors for Python. And the first thing he noticed, which some of you guys might notice, is that uh, it used uh, Python 2.7. And he's like, why are you doing that? Well, I jokingly told him it's because uh, I don't like parentheses around my quotes and print statements, which he did not like. But the real, but the real reason is uh, for the API that we use for production right now, uh, Python 3.6 support is coming, but right now the actual production push is done in 2.7. So I just wanted to preface everything so people don't, are, I know there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of friction in the community about people saying that I should move on. Um, all right, so to get started, the first thing I do is I import a workspace. Essentially what this is, is you saw earlier I uploaded some data in the portal. This gives me access to the portal. Then I have uh, a couple keys and constants here. So this is, again, all this stuff is gonna be removed at the end of the day. So if you wanna take pictures, you can, but it's not gonna be very useful for you. Uh, then essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull in our data. So essentially I'm gonna use our workspace and we're gonna create two channels, one for our uh, raw data and one for our edited data. And we're gonna essentially create, turn it into a Pandas data frame. And we're gonna essentially, and we're gonna set the index based on the time value, so that we can actually see the status time value, and um, and you can visualize. Now you guys can kind of see what this this data looks like. So I have my velocity and my velocity edit. Now, what's velocity edit? As I said before, you know it's really hard for these people to differentiate between uh, anomalies that are caused by inflow and infiltration and anomalies caused by sensor data. So how do they do it today? They actually hire analysts who have one of the worst jobs in the world. They manually sift through every channel and remove all the data, or, or modify, and tinker with all the data that they know there's a sensor error around and try to fit some sort of distribution to it. So we know based on that where the errors are. And so now we can uh, essentially take this data and we're gonna do two things. One is we're going to generate uh, end windows. The reason I do this is for when we're doing binary classification with time series data, we need, uh, it, binary classification tends to be um, uh, discrete, so it's, it doesn't assume that the data comes one, one at each point comes one after another. It doesn't uh, take into account the history of the data. So one way around that is by taking each of our points and we take the history of the values from the last four uh, the last four time increments and we create each of those as one of our as our input features so for each of our input features we have the current value and then the four that precede that and that way when we make our prediction in the future we're looking at the last four values to predict the next one um, and then we're gonna tag anomalies again really simple here essentially what we're doing is we're just taking the difference between the curated data and the raw data, and if there's a change more than a, a very small amount, then we know that it's an anomaly, and you can kind of visualize what that looks like here. So now we have, uh, we can see whether something's an anomaly or not. Uh, we can see how much of an anomaly it is. We have the last four readings and the current reading. And we can do some things where we can count. We can see we have 495 anomalies in the data, and now we're gonna, what I would say is we should uh, visualize the data. So the first thing, part of the, in my opinion, when you're doing data science, 
one of the things that often gets overlooked, though I'm sure not by people in this room, is actually playing with your data before you build the model. You know, I work with a lot of customers, a lot of partners across uh, many different countries, and a lot of people try to take their data and they, try, they think mainly about the algorithms. They think, uh, try to use boost trees, or they try uh, now with the deep learning craze, they're throwing LSTMs at this, or trying to do c crazy convolution, but they don't actually sit down to see what are the trends to play with the data, to visualize their data, and come up with a solid approach I find that the algorithms are critical, but they're secondary because it really depends on the, the amount of ambiguity in the system. And if you actually have something that's pretty, if you can phrase your problem in something that's, especially in a classification sense, that's something that's relatively linearly uh, differentiable, then the model pretty much will do all that work for it. You've all done all, most of the work for the model which makes it much, much easier. So in order to do that, we're going to visualize the data. So just going to visualize uh, discrete, some discrete points between on one given day. And we're going to plot some sample patterns. So the first thing I'm going to do is plot a sample daily pattern with no anomalies. And we're going to try to see that this data makes sense. And what you'll notice here is you'll notice some interesting trends to start out with. So this data starts at midnight. And you can see that overnight, the flow goes down and then slowly around 6 o'clock it starts going up. Why might that be? Well, at night people are sleeping and the factories are shut down. So there's less water coming into the uh, waste water management system. And as it wakes up, you know, early construction, it pushes and pushes up the water consumption and also people showering and getting out and then it starts to regulate for the rest of the day until and if we were to expand this, which I won't do right now, but if we were to expand this, you'd see that this is pretty much a, a standard cycle that happens most of the time. Um, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to see, well, what happens during anomalies? And you'll see that this is where it gets really much more interesting, because there are a couple things around sensor error assumptions that you would make if you didn't visualize this data. Number one is when you're dealing with sensor error, and, and this was brought up yesterday to me when I was uh, speaking with uh, somebody at the speaker's dinner, they're like, well, shouldn't it be really easy? You know, if you see that you go from you know, a really high flow of, let's say, 50, 20 uh, meters or whatever per second, and then it drops to, you know, zero or 0.2 over, or, or changes over the second of, you know, milliseconds, that should be indica indicative of, a, of anomaly. And while that's true, and you can actually kind of visualize that, sometimes the readings are actually more gradual and also sometimes you have weather events like flash floods that surprisingly, not over a period of milliseconds, but actually would match that same signal. So what's interesting here is it's still linearly differentiable, but it helps challenge some of the uh, assumptions we would have made before. So the, ne the next thing we're going to do is we're going to compare a couple different models. Uh, and I'm going to take three approaches. The first approach is we're going to First, we're going to define some metrics. So I'm going to use scikit-learn's uh, metrics. We're going to use a confusion matrix. We're going to use the classification report, which gives us F1 score, precision recall, all the standard classification metrics. Um, and then we're going to do two things. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the naive approach. We're going to use Microsoft's uh, anomaly detection API to just find out. And you could use anyone. You can use the Twitter package. I'm, I'm, Again, I'm not here to sell Microsoft, but w f because I work there, I use that. Um, it's free for me. So, uh, but we used um, the anomaly detection package, and then we're going to just see how that relates to the data that we have, and we're going to build a, a very simple model off that. So you can see here, we've taken our values for pre-processing. We send them to this service, which we consume through JSON. And we get our results back. And this is actually pretty good, but you'll notice something interesting here. You know, and this is where metrics are really, really important. You know, if I was an analyst, what I would do is I'd look at the bottom and I'd see these average totals and I'd say, I have a model that has 97% uh, F score, we're good, let's ship. But if you actually look at this model, what it's doing here is it's pretty good at recognizing where the anomalies are, but it actually is pretty bad. It, it biases and it takes a lot of regular 
or flow that's actually not anomalies and calls it anomalies. And those probably are, in our case, the inflow and infiltration that we don't want removed. So that's the first thing that we're going to do. Uh, and, and you can see that that method worked, but not really how we wanted it to. And it's important to be able to evaluate your metrics there. The second model we're going to do, this one's going to be very, very simple. We're going to take a random forest. We're going to use a binary classifier on this. And you're going to see that it probably overfit here. But we get much, much better results when it comes to the distribution across uh, tagging anomalies and regular uh, and regular velocity. But one of the challenges here, though, is, and I can see from some of the looks in the room, is you guys are right. This is probably something that's not going to scale very well because it's probably fit towards the one sample of data that we have. So, ah, 10 minutes left. Perfect. I think we're going to hit that mark to the letter. So, the one other approach that we did here just for the high level experimentation is a hybrid classification approach. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to take all the outliers from the outlier detection model. We're going to build a model just on those, so just on those a few discrete points. And we're going to hope that that linearly differentiates between the outliers and the anomalies. And then we're going to scale that to the rest of our, our data so we can see whether it actually scales. And this one actually works much, much better. Again, it's probably overfitting based on this data set because this is a more of a, a toy sample versus the actual production stuff that Carl Data is using. But you'll see here that the distribution for anomalies and regular velocity across the same data scales a lot better. So again, that's our model. Now we have that model. That's great. But you know, a model by itself is not very useful if I can't put it into production and actually use it. So now I'm going to show you how we can do that. So the first thing that we're gonna, I'm going to show you is the Azure ML client API. Uh, essentially what this allows you to do is it allows you to take your workspace and a couple very simple decorators for each of your, uh, input, uh, uh, your inputs or parameters and just wrap a function. And when I click run, essentially it creates a service for this function. So now I'm going to actually run, oh, well, obviously not because I didn't run anything else in the uh, notebook. But one second, I can, I can fix that for you guys. Let's go just quickly run through this. All right, perfect. And I'm just going to, we're going to run that second model because it takes the less time to train. All right, perfect. And now when I put this, essentially what I can do here is I put this model into production. And you can see now I have these endpoints and I can consume this. And this is where if I go back to my ML Studio, I can go to web services and I can consume this just like any other API, which is really cool. So I can actually, for people who are not uh, Python people, you can even use it in Excel. But for everyone here, I can test, I can run it. And there's actually, what's really cool is there's um, documentation that shows me exactly. I just copy and paste it. And I can run this. And it's already pre-formatted for. Uh, Python at the way bottom here. So I just click Python, I copy and paste this into my script, and now I can run this model that I've trained on the cloud in production. Um, that's, so that's step one. Sorry, one second. Yep. So now that I've done that, we're going to just test two things. We're going to run uh, on something that's clearly anomaly. So this is a flow where the last four values were zero, and it jumps up to 10. That's irregular. So that's anomaly. We see that. And we're going to test this on normal flow. So this is something where the values are all within a standard range. And we see that this, this works. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to use the event hubs. And in order to do this, you essentially what you do is you go to your Azure portal. And I've taken the liberty of creating one here. How many more minutes? I have five minutes left. Perfect. That's perfect amount of time. So I'm going to go to my resource group here. And essentially what you do is you create what's called a service bus. So service bus allows you to manage event hubs or IoT hubs for different things. And 
within that, I just generate this and I take my keys and I will copy and paste that. I'll take all this information and I just copy and paste that into here. So I have my service bus name that I created, the name of the key and just some key values. Again, this is all gonna be deprecated at the end of this. So, I mean, feel free to take a picture now, but it won't work tomorrow. Um, and then essentially I initialize an API for that service bus and I create a new uh, event hub in the service bus, which is again, one line of code, really nice here. And then I just declare this function. So what does this function do? It's called send to event hub. And this is what would, I would put on my device. It essentially allows me to, to, to take a time, the current velocity, and see whether it's anomaly. And I send that to um, the event hub. And what we can do here is I can actually, I can run this for you. We can run this in real time. So we can simulate what it would be like for a device to be sending information to Event Hub. So now we have this device. It's send, each time it's going here, it's sending information to our Event Hub. We can actually now see that in our Event Hub. If we go to the overview, you can actually see the, the data coming in. And then what we can do here is go back to my resource group, and we're going to use uh, Stream Analytics. So what Stream Analytics allows me to do here, one second. What Stream Analytics allows me to do is it allows me to process this data in real time. And all I have to do is create a query. So essentially what this query, do, what this is a very simple query, what it's telling me to do is as the data comes into my, um, oh, you guys can't see this, one second, let me make it bigger. As this data comes into my uh, event hub, take it and send it to Power BI for visualization. And then what's really cool is I can now go in and visualize this data in real time. If I'm an analyst, I don't need to know anything what's going on behind the scenes. I can see my flow going. And if there's an anomaly, and this is happening in real time, I can see those anomalies and differentiate them from inflow and infiltration. And then I can use that to build more predictive models if I'm Carl Data. So again, Thanks so much. I guess I'll open up for Q&A, and if you guys have any questions afterwards, feel free to find me.